Daniel Dombrowski and Philip Clayton will be talking this afternoon. Uh, I assume Philip will be showing up a little bit later uh, as he has an extremely busy schedule here these days, as always. But speaking first will be uh, Daniel Dombrowski, professor of philosophy at uh, Seattle University. And I discovered born the same year as I was, which will remain anonymous. Uh, author of 17 books. And uh, we all have a huge debt of gratitude, the editor for process, the Journal of Process Studies. Uh, no small task. And of course, noted vegetarian. <laughs> so I, I believe you're speaking on David's turn from beef to beets. Are you, uh, am I correct on that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he will be speaking on, on the mind body problem. Oh, the mind body problem. Well, I love to hear that. Thank you. Well, welcome up here. Please welcome Daniel Dombrowski. <laughs> Thanks, John. And I want to say I'm very honored to be here. I am not a former student of David's. I'm uh -huh. one of those people who has read John Cobb and David from afar in other time zones and uh, was attracted to Claremont from you know, a long distance away. Uh, the title of my paper is Griffin's Pan-Experientialism as Philosophia Perennis, or to translate the Latin, uh, Griffin's pan-experientialism pan as perennial philosophy. Uh, the first section is titled, The Need for a Radical Approach. The title to David Ray Griffin's book, Unsnarling the World Not, Consciousness, Freedom, and the Mind-Body Problem, which David tells me he thinks is his best book. So, so this is the linchpin. Uh, uh, it alludes to a rope metaphor from Schopenhauer to the effect that the key philosophical problem since the 17th century, I mean, the key philosophical problem since the 17th century, the mind-body problem, is on prevailing assumptions unsolvable. At the risk of mixing metaphors, one can highlight several different prominent contemporary philosophers of mind to illustrate why we are tied in a world not. William Seeger claims that we have no idea whatsoever how consciousness emerges from matter. Yaguan Kim holds that we have reached a dead end regarding the mind-body problem. Colin McGinn alleges that we will never be able to understand the emergence of consciousness from the brain. John Searle suggests that most of mainstream philosophy of mind is obviously false. And Galen Strawson maintains that only a revolutionary new way of thinking will enable us to re respond adequately to the mind-body problem. Although Daniel Dennett is a bit more optimistic regarding a solution to the mind-body problem on prevailing assumptions, even he sees consciousness as a mystery. In full light of the enormity of the difficulty, Griffin hopes to unsnarl the world not. It might be assumed that this unsnarling is an instance of the new revolutionary thinking called for by Strawson, but Thomas Nagel's phrasing of the same view may be more helpful when he says that radical speculation is needed in order to unsnarl the world not. I am taking the etymology of the word radical seriously in that it comes from the Latin radix for root. That is, Griffin has offered an oxymoronic, radically new approach to the mind-body problem, just as he is trying to revitalize an old solution to it. In the present paper, I will be attempting to find for Griffin a place of honor within a perennial tradition that goes back to Plato. As Josiah Royce once suggested, Whenever I have most carefully revised my standards, I am always able to see that at best I have been finding out in some new light the true meaning that was latent in old traditions. Revision does not mean mere destruction. Let us bury the natural body of tradition. What we want is its glorified body and its immortal soul. Uh, Whitehead once made a similar point in Adventures of Ideas. Undoubtedly, philosophy is dominated by its past literature to a greater extent that, than any other science, and rightly so. But the claim that it, it has acquired a, a set of technical terms sufficient for its purposes and exhaustive of its meanings is entirely unfounded. But this gets us ahead of the story, or better, it prematurely puts us behind it. It will serve us well to get clear at the outset regarding what the problem is. How can experience arise out of and act back upon non-experience? The two major contemporary responses to this question, dualism and materialism, engage in thinking that is both wishful and fearful. I see this addition, and fearful, to be one of Griffin's most significant achievements in that both of these responses are often driven by fears that are frequently not acknowledged. 
One does sometimes hear dualists express their fear that life would not be meaningful if human beings were put on a material par with clocks or computers. But it is also instructive to note that materialists are often fearful of a return to belief in supernaturalism and miracles if dualism is accepted. Hence, dualism is to be avoided at all costs, according to fearful materialists like Dennett. Even if Dennett is apparently oblivious to the fact that there are defenders of theistic met metaphysics like Griffin, who are also opponents to supernaturalism and miracles, as the title to one of his books makes clear, Reenchantment Without Supernaturalism. By at least acknowledging the existence of wishful and fearful thinking in both forms, Griffin suggests, we might more easily work our way to a better solution to the problem. Once again, some notable philosophers of mind like McGinn think that the mind-body pro problem is permanently unsolvable because of the persistent mystery regarding how mechanical insentient neurons, assuming that there are such, can give rise to conscious experience in organisms. If McGinn is correct, it makes sense for Kim to claim that mechanistic materialism in particular is a dead end. The next section is titled Source of the Problem. The root of the difficulty, if not of the solution, infamously goes back to Descartes and his enormous influence. Unlike most critics of Descartes, however, Griffin locates the problem not with Descartes' view of mind, but rather with his view of mechanistic matter. This is another signal contribution from Griffin. Indeed, there are problems with Descartes' view of mind as constituted by a, t a purely temporal inside with no spatiality. But even more problematic on Griffin's insightful reading are the issues concerning Descartes' view of matter as strictly outside and hence devoid of internal relations and purely spatial in the sense that it can be understood in an instant without temporal and hence causal relations. The problems unique to dualism are well known. It cannot account well or even plausibly for interaction between mind and body and it violates the understandable assumption that there is continuity in nature. And the problems unique to mechanistic materialism are also well known, even if they are typically not proclaimed as loudly as those with dualism. Mechanistic materialists have a devil of a time explaining the unity of, exp of experience if it is composed of billions of insentient neurons. It typically either leaves consciousness out of consideration or treats it as an emergent or supervenient afterthought. I have a good friend who teaches analytic philosophy of mind who never treats the issue of consciousness in his course. And his explanation is we're on the quarter system, not the semester system. <laughs> <laughs> and it contradicts what Griffin calls certain hardcore common sense notions like belief in human freedom. By the way, this is another one of Griffin's significant contributions. He distinguishes between certain soft common sense notions, which apply only contingently in some circumstances, but not others, and hardcore common sense notions whose denial is inevitably contradicted by our practice, such as belief in an external world, belief in human freedom and hence responsibility, and belief in efficient causality from the past. Contemporary philosophers of mind tend to emphasize either the problems unique to dualism or those unique to mechanistic materialism. But from Griffin's radical pan-experientialist standpoint, which lies outside the provenance of either dualism or mechanistic materialism, it is clear that there are some problems that are common to both dualism and mechanistic materialism. Among these are difficulties in, in determining where the line should be drawn between experiencing and non-experiencing beings, a difficulty that is avoided in pan-experientialism, as we will see, in accounting for consciousness in some fashion other than as the great exception in nature, and in explaining how experience could emerge out of machine-like non-experience. All of these problems, those unique to dualism, those unique to mechanistic materialism, and those shared by dualism and mechanistic materialism can be traced back to Descartes' views, especially to his view of machine-like matter. If mind is supposed to be pure temporality with no spatiality, and if matter is supposed to be pure spatiality with no internal duration and no experience of temporal passage, then the remarkable view of Whitehead, embraced in a nuanced way by Griffin, stands in stark opposition. Now this is a quote from the concept of nature of Whitehead. It's one that I think hardly ever gets quoted. The mutual structural relations between events are both spatial and temporal. 
If you think of them as merely spatial, you are omitting the temporal element. And if you think of them as merely temporal, you are omitting the spatial element. Thus, when you think of space alone or of time alone, you are dealing in abstractions. Namely, you are leaving out an essential element in the life of nature as known to you in experience. It should be emphasized that there's one sort of emergentism that is acceptable to Griffin, the emergence of complex experiences out of the simple experiences of actual occasions or events or microscopic organisms. What is unintelligible is the emergence of an experiential inside out of non-experiential bits of machinery governed strictly in terms of external relations. The latter sort of emergence would involve sheer magic, as the pan-experientialist geneticists Sewell Wright put it. Even the materialist J.J.C. Smart points out colloquially that no enzyme can catalyze the production of a spook. That is, the conscious experience that arises out of the primitive, pre-conscious, yet experiential, organic reality of brain cells is, at least in principle, understandable. What is unintelligible is the idea that complex conscious experiences arise out of completely insentient, non-experiential mechanical constituents. Once again, the root of the difficulty is to be found in Descartes' view of matter as vacuous actua actuality, devoid of temporality, experience, and internal relatedness to the past. The debate between dualism and mechanistic materialism is a family quarrel on Griffin's view in that the latter takes its meanings of both mind and matter from the former. Another way to put the point is to say that mechanistic materialism just is dualism in disguise. Once the dualistic ghost in the machine is exorcised by the materialist, what is left is the same mechanized nature that characterized almost all of reality on the dualist's own terms, the exceptions being the relatively infrequent ghosts in a predominantly mechanical world. We will see that Griffin's way out of these difficulties involves not only avoiding the view of matter as vacuous actuality, that is, as devoid of any sort of internal becoming or experiential mattering, but also avoiding the view that insentient aggregates of sentient constituents, for example, rocks or telephones, are the most concrete realities. This view is an instance of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness if the res vere are concrete occasions of momentary experience. Another case of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness is found when high-level consciousness is seen as the primary, most concrete reality, when in point of fact such consciousness is rather rare and abstract in contrast to ubiquitous organic feeling of a more primitive sort. Both bottom-up mechanistic materialism and top-down dualism approaches to the mind-body problem ultimately lead to insoluble problems regarding the initially excluded reality. Pan-experientialism promises a higher degree of integration of our knowledge than, it, than its alternatives, but not at the expense of explanatory adequacy. The Cartesian view of matter, as well as the reductionist view of matter, as vacuous actuality is, it should be noted, never experienced by us. Belief in matter of this sort is the result of high-level abstraction involving concepts like extension and mass. It is preci precisely this pulpy character of vacuous actuality that makes the emergence of experience out of it difficult, if not impossible, to understand. Uh, the next section is titled, Being is Power. The thesis of the present paper is that Griffin's unsnarling of the world not is a highly original, indeed courageous, presentation of a very old view that goes back to Plato. At one point in his book, Griffin acknowledges this in a reference to Plato that unfortunately did not make it into the index of the book. <laughs> the, the passage in question is from the sophist, where the Eleatic stranger, presumably Plato, offers the following definition of being, and I quote, I suggest that anything has real being that is so constituted as to possess any sort of power either to affect anything else or, ite, to be affected in however small a degree by the most insignificant agent, though it be only once. I am proposing as a mark to distinguish real things that they are nothing but power, dynamis. Two terminological observations are needed. First, 
It is no accident that the Greek word for power, dynamis, is also the root of our word dynamic. And it is precisely this identification of being with organic dynamic power that makes Plato's later metaphysics so appealing to process thinkers like Whitehead, Hartshorn, Griffin, and myself. In these thinkers, dynamic power is the organic drive of the universe. Second, Plato's use of or, ite, however, would have to be changed to and, chi, in order to be congruent with Griffin's view. This is because the mind-body problem cannot be solved as long as it is assumed that there are some beings that can act on others, but nonetheless remain completely unmoved by others on the one hand, while there are other beings, vac vacuous actualities, that can supinely be acted upon by others, but that exert no agency on the other. On Griffin's view, the primary beings are actual occasions that have both the dynamic power to receive influence from the past and the dynamic power to creatively render determinate in the present what were once future determinables. Mainstream philosophers of mind need to be reminded that Griffin's view is not pan-consciousness, but pan-experientialism. Consciousness, when seen as a type of specialized experience that involves a contrast between affirmation and negation, and that emerges only in those beings with central nervous systems, involves not only a high level of experience, but also of spontaneity. Even though experience and spontaneity, spontaneity are distributed throughout nature, consciousness is not. This point is worth emphasizing because of the alleged implausibility of Griffin's pan-experientialism, an implausibility that would be quite understandable if pan-experientialism were to be equated with pan-consciousness. I suspect that pan-experientialism would have fewer critics if they realized that it is a view that is part of the effort to thoroughly naturalize the world to rid it of both supernaturalism and its anomalous status when it, is, when it is interpreted by the Siamese twins joined at the hip, dualism and mechanistic materialism. That is, naturalism and physicalism are not synonyms for materialism. Griffin's view is both naturalistic and physicalist, but it is not a type of materialism if this term refers to the Cartesian belief that matter consists in purely external relations with no internal relations or experience. That is, Griffin's view is not materialist if matter refers to vacuous actuality. Further, pan-experientialism is not only a type of naturalism, it's a type of monism in that on its basis there is only one sort of actuality, actual occasions with a physical pole which has the dynamic power to receive influence from the past and a mental pole which has the dynamic power to bring about at least a partially novel advance into the future. Because experience, which at its highest levels gives rise to consciousness, is not the great exception to everything else that is going on in nature. Pan-experientialism provides hope that the mind-body problem can be responded to adequately. Griffin starts from the realization that our experience is itself a part of nature. It is nature known from the inside, which does not commit Griffin to the dualistic implications often found in introspectionist psychology. Generalizing from this experiential nature that we know best, we can claim that experience is the very nature of nature. The feelings one has of what happened in one's past a second ago provide an analogy for what happens all the way down in nature. This view avoids the problems that are created in dualism and mechanistic materialism when experience is, in effect, placed outside of nature. In a word, mechanistic materialism is half-hearted. Or again, Griffin agrees with dualists and mechanistic materialists that it is crucial that we observe nature, but he insightfully disagrees with them in claiming that the most direct way to observe nature is to observe it working in ourselves as experiencing beings. The platonic view that Griffin defends is metaphysical or transcendental in the sense that he is offering an account of the universal characteristics of experiencing individuals which is something of a redundancy for pan-experientialists. These characteristics would include both the dynamic power to feel causal influence from the past, to prehend the physical forces that impinge on an experiencing individual, and the dynamic power to add something new in however slight a way. Griffin speaks of a perpetual oscillation in that there is duality within each organic event, wherein efficient causation from the past yields to a literal decision a cutting off of some possibilities regarding the future, 
which then yields to efficient causation being exerted on future events and so on ad infinitum. Because each event is subject for itself and an object for others, no event is simply a subject or simply an object, contra-dualism and mechanistic materialism. Reality is characterized by the power in subjects that become objects. This stance is compatible with the view that every event has a physical aspect of receiving efficient causality from the past. Hence, Griffin's position can be described as a type of physicalism, even if it is not a type of materialism, wherein there are vacuous actualities that are simply mechanical objects. Finally, this pan-experientialist characterization of the real as constituted by dyna dynamic centers of power applies to electrons, organelles, cells, simple animals, mammals, primates, and human beings as the mental pole expands at each level, but never to the point where the physical pole vanishes. The claim that being is power has clear theological implications. If there were an omnipotent being with all power, then such power would be exercised over absolutely nothing or over the absolutely powerless, neither of which makes sense if any claim regarding what absolute nothingness is is itself contradictory and if being is power, respectively. Hartshorn puts the point in an insightful way. Whitehead does not limit the power of God as compared to some conceivably more powerful being. He merely points out that there is a social element in the very idea of power. In Whitehead's terms, every occasion is in some measure self-determining and in some measure passive, receptive toward the self-determinations of others. Creativity is not a power, but just power. It is a sense, in a sense, to be is to create, and belief in a so-called inorganic nature is the result of the very slight degree of creative power found there. The next uh, section is titled From pa Plato to Descartes and From Descartes to Kant. So we're going to make some progress here <laughs> chronologically. Um, the question understandably arises. If Plato was close to a defensible position regarding the relationship between mind and body, what happened in the period between him and Descartes? and by implication between him and where we are today with the mind-body dead end. A short answer to this question would point to Plato himself as the culprit. To be sure, there's much in Plato's dialogues that is congenial to Griffin's pan-experientialism, in addition to the above definition of being as dynamic power in a sophist. For example, there are passages in Plato's dialogues that hint at pan-experientialism in the Phaedrus and Laws and Epinomus. In that psyche, defined in terms of self-motion, is required in order to understand the dynamism of the natural world. By contrast, there is also well-known evidence in Plato, and a great deal of it, that supports the case for dualism. And it is this latter evidence that has been historically dominant, especially in terms of the effort of St. Augustine and others to Christianize Plato or to Platonize Christianity. After all, the Cartesian dictum, often depicted as self-evident, that mind is inextended in contrast to the more defensible view that experiences have spatio-temporal relations was Augustinian before it was Cartesian. In this regard, Griffin is a part of a tradition within process thought to uncover a lost process Platonism, a tradition that includes Whitehead, Hartzorn, Leonard Eslick, and others. To be precise, Griffin's pan-experientialism is prefigured in ancient philosophy in terms of a conjunction of three different concepts. Granted, no single ancient author put these three points together, but when they are configured by a contemporary scholar, one is able to see a strong resemblance to Griffin's pan-experientialism. First, Plato's discovery in the sophist of the metaphysical concept that being is dynamic power. Second, his definition of psyche and the Phaedrus and laws in terms of self-motion, a definition that is amplified by Aristotelian hylomorphism and kinesis. And third, the Epicurean belief that ultimate reality is atomic in character. When these three concepts are put together, one derives a view wherein dynamic power and self-motion are seen to go all the way down. Because of Whitehead's frequent crit criticisms of the subject predicate logic in Aristotle, based as it is on a metaphysic centered on the substance accident distinction, some process thinkers have concluded that process metaphysics is completely removed from Aristotle and from those he influenced in medieval philosophy. But the situation here is just as complicated as it is regarding Plato. For example, 
Two very scholarly books have, been rec have recently appeared written by Thomists, heavily influenced not only by Aristotle but also by Whitehead, speaking of James Felt and Nori Clark. And both are somewhat favorably disposed toward Griffin's view. These process-enriched Thomists try to rescue Aristotle and Thomas from the charge that there is insufficient dynamism in metaphysics, with Whitehead providing the inspiration for their efforts. In the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, on their interpretation, matter is not the vacuous actuality it is in Descartes in that it is always informed. Or again, the whole point to Aristotelian Thomistic hylomorphism is to suggest that matter without form and form without matter are the results of abstraction in that concrete reality is populated by form bodies or mind bodies or soul bodies to, to, ter to coin terms that try to capture the non-dualistic character of hylomorphs. Now, there's, I'm trying to say those terms quickly <laughs> to give you a feel for the fusion of mind and body in that tradition. The Aristotelian idea that mind is, in a manner, all things is a protest against the view that mind is what is left over when one abstracts away from either behavior or matter. Rather, matter in motion just is mind in some fashion. Griffin's view is awful, also medieval in the sense that scholastic thinkers often distinguished, albeit inconsistently, between the categories, which were concepts that were applicable to all creatures but not to God, and the transcendentals, which were concepts that were applicable to all beings, including God. It is often noticed that among the transcendentals were oneness, goodness, truth, and beauty. In addition, there was power, the ability to influence others, and in the process thinking exemplified by Griffin, the ability to be influenced. That is, one way to interpret what Griffin is doing is to say that the dynamic power to receive influence from others, as well as the dynamic power to creatively advance beyond such influence, in that there are never sufficient causal conditions from the past to determine completely concrete actuality in the present, although there are necessary conditions of some sort, is a transcendental. As before, it is Descartes and his legacy regarding matter that is Griffin's adversary, not pre-modern pre philosophy, whether ancient or medieval. Whitehead, it will be remembered, thought of his philosophy as a reference or a recurrence to pre-Kantian modes of thought. In this regard, it is instructive to remember that no less an authority than Ivor Leclerc thought of Whitehead as a dy dynamic hylomorphist. My point here is to highlight the long tradition in philosophy that Griffin is not only revitalizing, but advancing after a three century slowdown due to Descartes' influential view of matter as vacuous actuality. As Whitehead once said, and as I, th I think Griffin should affirm, nothing in thought is ever completely new. Griffin is not being denigrated, nor is Whitehead when they are seen as important footnotes to Plato. Although Griffin mentions only briefly the pre-modern roots of his pan-experientialism, he pays careful attention to certain developments in modern philosophy that indicate the pushback that has occurred or that could occur with respect to the Cartesian view of matter and its effect on dominant modern and contemporary views of mind. For obvious reasons due to Leibniz's own panpsychism, especially in monadology, Griffin notes the importance of this great thinker. But Leclerc also alerts us to Leibniz's similarity to Aristotle. Newton insisted that an active principle had to be operative in nature and not ex machina, as in Descartes. But Leibniz thought that Newton did, in fact, unwittingly fall victim to the use of ex machina devices. Leibniz's defense of something fundamentally active in nature was seen by him as a return to the Greeks specifically to Aristotle's idea that physical existence were characterized by kinesis and dynamis. On Leclerc's interpretation, which adds historical depth to Griffin's view, both Leibniz and Whitehead signal a revitalization of the Aristotelian doctrine of internal change in power and matter and a denigration of the Cartesian denial of internal change and power. A denial, as Griffin notes, that has largely persisted to the present day. As Hartshorn puts the point, if upon the wreckage of Newtonian materialism, a new worldview is to arise, then Whitehead's system is the most important single indication of what that worldview would look like. It is customary to emphasize the fact that Hume awoke Kant from his dogmatic rationalist slumbers that were induced by Leibniz, Christian Wolff, and others. To view things exclusively in this way, however, is to fail to consider the possibility that the Leibnizian view may be more compatible with contemporary science than other modern views, including Kant's. Consider the idea 
that the usual classification of natural things as inanimate derives from a neglect of microscopic activity, as in the kinetic theory of heat, or the view that even rocks are in motion in their microscopic parts. That is, scholars tend not to accentuate the degree to which Leibniz's panpsychism had an influence on Kant. As a result, there is perhaps understandable tendency to read Kant's phenomena noumena distinction as being almost exclusively under the influence of Descartes. It is one of Griffin's signal achievements that he makes a convincing case for the claim that Kant, in his dreams of a spirit seer, came closer to pan-experientialism than most scholars realize, specifically in his discussion of what will later be called noumenal things in themselves in contrast to the phenomenal world as it appears to us. In this early work, Kant seems to think that either we should remain agnostic regarding things in themselves, or we should agree with Leibniz that they are instances of psyche. As is well known, Kant eventually opted for the former alternative. But the prominent place given to the latter alternative by Kant should not escape our notice, especially because it has not received the attention it deserves and hence may have unanticipated strengths. Kant appears to rebuke those who ridicule Leibniz's panpsychism because if we had to state what physical reality is in itself, we would have to follow Leibniz. Consider the following. In some sense, we know ourselves from the inside and other beings from the outside. What are the, what are the latter like in themselves? Because we have some knowledge from the inside and in that we are intimately aware of our own experiences. One wonders if others have insides as well. We need not assume that our purely spatial and external awareness of these objects exhausts what they are in themselves. Indeed, it would seem extravagant to make such an assumption. What would it be like to have no inside at all? What would it be like to be a vacu vacuous actuality is beyond our ken, as Griffin holds and as Kant indirectly intimates. It is consistent with Griffin's view to emphasize that Kant refused to identify things in themselves with lifeless matter and left open the possibility that they were instances of experience. We should be clear that when we experience green in a grove of trees, our immediate source for this experience are events that take place in living cells in our eyes and in the brain. Some quality is abstracted from these events and transformed into what we experience as greenness. Whitehead speaks of transmutation. This process of transforming many received data into one patch of experienced greenness is a mental operation that cannot be supposed to be enjoyed by cells in the optic nerve or in the brain in exactly the same way that it is found in human experience. But on the pan-experientialist view, there must be some quality analogous to greenness that the cells experience. Or again, if one has a toothache and if the transmission of the agitation from the cells in one's tooth to the brain is interrupted by an anesthetic, the cells may continue to have the same feelings as before, even if they are not transmuted into human experience. Because a single unitary experience of a human being is molded out of many stimuli, evidence from the five external senses, thousands of influences from the past, billions of experiences exerting their influence via brain cells, mechanical or automatic predictability is not likely. That is, prediction is limited not merely by our ignorance, but is rather due to the creative synthesis that is experience itself. Those who might come to appreciate Griffin's pan-experientialism in the future may very well be like the character in Moliere who did not realize that he had been speaking prose all of his life. Um, I'm gonna stop the historical part there and have one more section about historical thinking in general. If I had more time, I would not talk about the German idealists, <laughs> but I would talk about the English romantics who stole a lot of their ideas, if you read uh, Coleridge's Biographia, Biographia Literaria from the German idealists. So that is one big section I would like to include if I had more time. So um, I wonder if I could talk a little bit about historical thinking in general and then call it quits. Griffin's pan-experientialism belies the famous or infamous quip allegedly made by Quine that there are two quite different reasons why people enter philosophy, to do philosophy or merely to do history of philosophy. It has been the purpose of the present paper to argue that regarding Griffin's pan-experientialism, these two are not mutually exclusive. That is, thinking about the mind-body problem is historical thinking via Plato and Descartes whether or not philosophers of mind realize it. To admit this much, however, is not necessarily to commit to the intellectually conservative claim 
that we stand on the shoulders of giants like Plato, and that it is equally true to say that we stand in there, for example, Descartes' dark shadow. Once again, to be is to exhibit both the dynamic power to prehend causal influence from the past and the dynamic power to unsnarl knots. It should be noted that what it means to be a process thinker in the wake of Griffin is to say not only that the reality of events is successive, but also cumulative. Through prehension of causal influence, the present, in a way, includes the past. Hence, we should, not, we should be suspicious of thinkers who largely dispense with philosophers from previous centuries. <clears throat> Intellectual history is one of the principal sources for contemporary wisdom, including wisdom regarding what has come to be called the mind-body problem. Or again, to be a process thinker in the wake of Griffin is to hold that becoming is both cumulative and creative in that the new at any moment is not already in the cards or entailed by previous events or conditions. Nonetheless, the cumulative ca character of process means that these conditions are in some sense contained in the new. In Hartzornian terms congenial to Griffin's project, each instance of becoming is a creative synthesis. David Ray Griffin is to be thanked for alerting us to the fact that it is a new ball game in philosophy of mind in that pan-experientialism is now a reputable player. Understanding this fact, however, is extremely difficult without an awareness of earlier games and earlier players. Process thinkers, it should be noted, have defended this view throughout the 20th century. Whereas, you know, the analytic philosophers of mind who are panpsychists came on us just a few years ago. That is, Griffin has shown that pan-experientialism will not go away simply because it has been largely ignored for a mere 300 years. To paraphrase Emerson, for my own purposes, when the half-gods of dualism and mechanistic materialism depart, the gods of pan-experientialism can arrive. Thank you. I said uh, while last night because most of you had not heard uh, Gary Dorian before, and I think you had a wow experience. We've heard a bunch of other excellent speeches, but most of you have heard these people before, so you were not surprised. But there's a reason to lift up uh, Dan Dabrowski. Um, originally, the lecture on the mind-body problem was, uh, and Starling World Not, was to be given by a different philosopher. He was a good friend of mine. He is a good friend of mine. We had gone uh, to a summer session together, uh, six weeks of American philosophy, in which we uh, uh, had a whole week on uh, Whitehead, and uh, almost every day we played ping pong. So he became very close friends. Well, he wrote a very good review of the Unsnarling the World Nut. So it was natural to invite him uh, to the conference. But then it turned out he had developed uh, uh, an illness that made it, he felt, impossible for him to come. Well, <clears throat> there were, as you see, we've gone very quickly <laughs> and have many, many speakers here. There were still more people that uh, I, I wished we could have invited. And in some cases, uh, that turned out not to be possible. But in this case, we had held Don, Dan Dabrowski in reserve as a kind of utility infielder <laughs> who could do infielder, outfielder, who could play almost any position. And so when this philosopher couldn't come through, we turned to Dan Dabrowski. I pointed out, well, this guy can do anything. <laughs> and um, he had never before written a book on the mind-body problem, I believe. Had you even written a paper on it? Can you believe that he wrote this paper, was his first paper on the mind-body problem? Pretty amazing. Anyway, these quotations you gave at the beginning of uh, these people who say the mind-body problem is insoluble, um, uh, two of these, of course, were Seeger 
and, and Gail and, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, Seeger was one of those. And, and he, in the meantime, has endorsed pan-experientialism. He came to the conference. He was not con uh, persuaded, but he went home and did some more work on it and started writing about panpsychism or pan-experientialism. And then this Galen Strawson, whom I had wished I would have invited to that conference, but just from a fluke, uh, didn't and voted, invited, invited uh, Galen, uh, or excuse me, uh, Colin McGinn instead. Um, it might have been very different. We might have had pan-experientialism becoming a popular movement uh, 15 years ago if we had had uh, Strawson. But anyway, it's, uh, it's going. You quote that statement from the philosopher who said, uh, what is it, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, a spook cannot be made out of, a, uh, enzymes cannot uh, materialize a spook or something like that. And to make clear what, what he was saying, by spook he meant a mind. He didn't mean a ghost or anything, he meant a mind. So he was saying that the idea of a mind is completely impossible because the body is physical, and the physical can't produce something non-physical. So that's the, the problem of, of dualism or materialism, as Dan correctly say, e equally bad. Now, um, China has taken, uh, took a, a almost instant loving uh, uh, for, for, for Whitehead and uh, for uh, our kind of postmodern philosophy. And the term, of course, was, the book was The Reenchantment of Science. And in that book, I was using the word reenchantment not in the really proper way to use it, as I did later, meaning that the world has moral values inherent in it, but simply in this simpler way of saying that the physical world uh, is alive. And that has, always been the Chinese view. Uh, Zhe may, may, may say something about that in his seven minutes <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, so that's a very interesting thing. So that uh, there are a few people in China and there are a few philosophers, hundreds of philosophers. And uh, so this, uh, this, this may uh, take, on, take off in a, in a big way, thanks. Uh, to developments inside, like Galen Strassen, and then uh, developments in uh, uh, China. Uh, finally, uh, let me conclude by saying thank you for uh, reminding us of uh, how much uh, uh, Plato, uh, uh, Whitehead, was simply in one more instance doing a footnote to Plato and uh, uh, thank you for correcting me, the, the fact that I ignored my own footnote to Plato, <laughs> and also that he was doing footnotes to Leibniz, and in a sense, a footnote to Kant, although in this case, we have to say, um, you know, Einstein uh, was noted uh, for his greatest mistake. Well, we could say the same thing with Kant. He took the wrong path. He could have gone this way. He went another way. This was Kant's greatest mistake. Thank you very much.